I kind of have a test for journalists that I've applied right during the years I've operated at a presidential campaign level. Once I kind of figured out what I didn't know, what I did, and felt like I was experienced around this very weird track. And my test is, what journalists am I talking to that could do this? If they were, if they had become, right, campaign people, right, that would have been able to do this. And it's a really small list. You are on that list. You would have been a really good political, Chuck Todd would have been, Bob Costa would have been, Ryan Lizza would have been, right? People who really are deep, Tim Alberta would have been, people who are deeply, deeply, deeply knowledgeable about politics, the country, the culture, its history, its sociology, its generations, all, all of that stuff. What, one of the fault lines, like in presidential politics, right, just as a, as a philosophy, right, is the nature of a presidential campaign. Is it a referendum on the president or is it a choice between candidates? I have always believed it is a choice, not a referendum on the, on the incumbent. And that's a really important thing to recognize. Now, the Biden campaign is saying that when the choice is clear, the choice will be Biden versus Trump. I'm going to tell you what I think the, the, the failure of logic is here. Why is Donald Trump winning today in an election that's going to be about a choice? Because I think the one thing that is clear, there's nothing new to learn about either Donald Trump or President Biden. There, there is no mystery left in our relationship as a people with either man. There is, there is no spring of discovery ahead. There is no Beaujolais of delight, right, about the whimsies <laughs> of their personalities yet, yet to be discovered. It is. It is. So in a two- team league, how do they account for the fact that they're losing to that team? That's who you're losing to, right? They're not losing to Abraham Lincoln. They're not losing to John Kennedy. They're not losing to Ronald Reagan. If they're not losing to Franklin Roosevelt. They're losing by nine points to Donald Trump in 2023. But I have a simple question. What's the explanation for that? Th so because they they've done everything right? Because the American people are crazy? What, what, tell me what the rationale for that is. Well, look, I think, one, Trump is winning in a series of recent polls. I don't think they're all plus nine. Um, it's going to be closer than that. But here are two responses. One, um, Kamala Harris channeled this on 60 Minutes on Sunday. She did an interview with Bill Whitaker. Um, it was fine. But <laughs> she said what the Biden White House does quite frequently, uh, which is, Voters might not be psyched about Joe Biden. Um, but once we are able to communicate what we've accomplished, then they'll come around and then the choice will be evident. By the way, Steve, I think that is very important for younger voters who don't like either political party, institutions, whatever, are very meh, not just on Biden, but the Democratic Party. But they do care about climate change and guns and the economy, and the administration's efforts on student loans. And so Kamala was saying, once we are able to remind people of that, they will come home. And they also point to abortion uh, as a big topic here. And they cite the 2022 midterms where 
and this gets back to the approval rating thing. Biden's approval rating sucked, but in the key states and the key Senate races, Democrats showed up because abortion was on the ballot. Um, and by the way, we'll see next Tuesday or in a couple of Tuesdays if that's true in Virginia, which is like, you know, a swing state on the state level, because that whole race is about abortion. So we'll see if that issue is st still resonant. If it's not, that could be a warning sign for Democrats heading into next year. But a big difference with 2022 is that turnout, the turnout expectations between two, the two parties have really changed since like Absolutely. 2008 when we were out there. So in a midterm election, it used to be uh, Republicans would blow Democrats away on turnout because Democrats rely on low propensity voters who don't really show up in midterm elections and off year elections. But Republicans have these older voters who pay attention and they vote every single election. That's kind of flipped on its head now. So Democrats are really engaged post-2016, like post-Trump. Like they, they seem to understand the stakes, and so they show up. And that's helped by the fact that people forget, like, yeah, Trump is a Republican and is winning the Republican primary and has a lot of Republican support. But there are a lot of people who like Trump who like weren't like typical Republican voters before 2016. And so when Trump is on the ballot, he has more people showing up in a presidential year. So the turnout expectations are kind of flipped. So I think one reason a lot of those Republicans lost in 2022 and Democrats won, it wasn't just abortion. It was also that people stayed home. Trump supporters stayed home because he wasn't on the ballot. They're not going to show up and vote for like Blake Masters. Like as much as he's Trumpy, he's not Donald Trump himself. Um, a lot of Trump supporters like Donald Trump and Jesus in that order and like no one else. <laughs> and so uh, that's a problem next year because he'll be on the ballot. And he again, he will always have that 46 to 47 percent feeling. Democrats have to have somebody who can get above that number. Uh, and a little bit higher because of the Electoral College. And, you know, right now, Biden is the only guy and your and your boy, Dean. <laughs> um, but it's it's pretty scary. I mean, this is like this. It's going to turn on a few, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 votes in the series of states. And I do want to, by the way, call out what you said earlier about the Trump campaign. Like your list as a journalist who deals with the Trump campaign. Um and I didn't like actually deal with them that much uh, the last time around in part because they were so like ham handed and all over the place. Um, you know, Chris Lasavita is there now. Uh, yeah, Donald Trump is facing over 90 criminal counts, but his campaign is much more well oiled. And I know this sounds a crazy thing to say about Donald Trump. And, and by the way, he said all kinds of like inflammatory and racist and, you know, things that inspire violence lately. <laughs> Um, but it's more disciplined. It is more disciplined. Um, and they kicked the shit out of Ron DeSantis uh, and like out of the gate. And they they just uh, it's a Brushed better them. campaign than it was in Brushed. 2020. To answer your question, uh, it, it is it's going to be a razor's edge election, I think. And Democrats better hope. And they think that, again, it will be a choice. They just need to communicate their issues better. But this also gets back to the stuff we're talking about at the very beginning of this podcast. How do you communicate um, the CHIPS Act or how do you communicate your climate investments in the hardest environment in world history to get a message out? You know, I mean, it's just so hard to distribute a message in this environment. And there's the old Roger Ailes famous saying, the orchestra pit theory of politics. You know, you have two candidates on a stage. One candidate says, I have a solution for Middle East peace. The other candidate falls in the orchestra pit. Which one is the press going to cover? The gaffe, you know, uh, Hunter Biden. You know, it's just like there's so many distractions. People are on TikTok. People are on Netflix. People are on WhatsApp. It's just like people don't know Joe Biden's accomplishments. And it's very hard to get that message out there in today's environment. Mm -hmm.